Pints with Jack, Season 3, Episode 22. Orwell's Clumsy Theosis. Hey everyone, this is just a quick bonus episode. This week on Pints with Jack, we spoke about how Orwell reached the end of herself. She decided that she was no longer going to be a rebel against the gods. And I spent a little bit of time talking about the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, how this is us declaring our spiritual bankruptcy before God. It's a declaration of dependence upon him and that this this is the real starting point to the spiritual life, knowing who we are and knowing who God is and knowing that we need God. Well, shortly after we finished recording that episode, an episode was released on the Clumsy Theosis podcast. It's run by my friend, Rochelle Lacerra. She's actually one of my oldest friends here in the United States. And she's just starting a series on the Beatitudes. And she spent quite a bit of time unpacking that first Beatitude. And so I just thought it was really relevant to our discussion of what's going on inside Orwell at the moment. So with her permission, we have included a section of her first podcast in her series on the Beatitudes. And I hope that it'll really enrich your thinking and our conversation about what's currently going on inside Orwell. Here it is. But whatever, I mean, I digress. The point is that I think that it's very important that we see the the very blatant connection between the Beatitudes and living a life of theosis, right? These are not just some ideals that maybe one day we'll get to and we'll be able to fulfill. No. They are there to help us as we journey through this life of theosis. But I think, I think you get the point now, right? So the Beatitudes, they teach us how to live in the kingdom of God as souls who have been transformed to reflect Christ himself. And speaking of reflections, right? This is how I'm tying, tying one topic to the next. Speaking of reflections, right? We want to reflect Christ himself, right? And so this is the part. This is a part from one of those talks that I gave over the weekend that I want to share with you, right? So let me set this up. During Lent, we hear a lot about dying to ourselves or dying to the world, which does not sound appealing. I mean, I do it because I know that I will be better for doing it. I know that after I die to myself, I will like myself better. I will be closer to the Lord, which is my desire at all times. But when you're going through that whole dying to yourself thing, it is not appealing. But as I shared in my talk, there is actually an appealing way to understand death to self. And in my opinion, a very beautiful explanation, one that I remind myself of during those moments when I don't want to die to myself, during those moments when I'm acting like a toddler having a temper tantrum and I'm in front of God the Father and I just don't want to do what I'm supposed to do, right? I think of iconography. Yes, iconography. Stay with me here. Icons are my favorite kind of religious art, but they are so much more than pretty pieces of art. Icons are windows into heaven. And we, in fact, you and me, we are all icons, right? We are intended to be windows into heaven by the way that we live, the way that we love, and the way that we are the presence of Jesus Christ in the world. But we know that we're not always windows into heaven, right? Because sometimes we become blurry icons. Things like just time and our sins or our mistake or our general fatigue, you know, like me having my little temper tantrums in front of our Father in heaven, right? These things, they have made us blurry icons. And during Lent, we are invited in a very special way to stand in front of the icon of Christ and behold ourselves as if in a mirror. We are looking at our reflection. See, you see how I tied that in there? And when we do this, we are able to see the difference between us and Christ. And we are invited to look at our reflections and see how blurry our icons have become. Granted, at face value, this might sound like a very crappy experience, but really, I promise you, it's not because this is what's happening. When we look at our reflection and our blurriness is being shown to us by the Lord, not because he wants to be like, "Mm, look at that, look at all the ways that you've sinned, look at all the ways that you've fallen, you're not good enough, blah, 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 yada, yada, you know, all these negative lies. No, he is doing this because he wants to show us all the places within us that he is seeking to restore, to restore to be like him. 
And in that moment, when we allow to see Jesus's truth, which is ultimate truth, because he is God, right? When we see the ultimate truth of God that Christ is showing us, we are actually diving into reality, which means that we're leaving the deceptions of this world and the distractions of this world behind us, right? We're dying to the world, we're dying to ourselves, and we're looking at the truth that Christ presents to us, which is a much more appealing perspective in my opinion. I find it so attractive, and that's why I constantly remind myself, (laughs) remind myself of iconography every time I feel like one of those little um, toddler temper tantrums is on its way, right? I think, no, you know what? I want to be transformed to be like Christ. Let him show me what needs to happen in order for that to go down. But this also raises some questions, right? Like things like, okay, well, what will my blurry icon look like after Christ makes it unblurry? Well, it's going to look like Christ, of course. But more specifically, it's going to look like someone who is inhabiting the kingdom of heaven, right? It's going to look like one who is perfect beatitude. And now you can see that we've come full circle to that opening statement that I made today, right? That statement that said, Jesus Christ is perfect beatitude. So now I have a question for you. Why does Jesus show us the blurry parts of our icon that he wishes to restore within us to his glory? Why does he show us these things? I mean, we've already covered that it's not to make us feel bad or to make us feel like, you know, we're just sucking at being Catholic or we're sucking at, you know, living the kingdom of heaven. It's because he's asking for our permission. He's asking for our cooperation. And a way that we can cooperate is via the Beatitudes. So let's look at the Beatitudes from the perspective of cooperating with Christ and doing some self-evaluation with him in front of his icon, right? So using his icon as a mirror and seeing our reflection and seeing all of the places within us that he wants to restore to his glory. So the Beatitudes, as we read in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. So the first Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To be poor in spirit is to be humble. It's to realize how utterly dependent on God we are for everything. And when we think of poverty, do we think of emptiness? I think of an emptiness that makes us perfect open vessels. And we're open vessels because we're ready to now receive God's will, right? We're ready to be filled with God's will. We've humbled ourselves and we have gotten rid of our will so that the Lord can fill us with his perfect will for our lives. But most importantly, being poor in spirit makes us able to accept our fallen nature. And then once we can see, yeah, there's a big difference between me and Christ. And then we can repent of those things that separate us from him. And then when we've repented, we can allow him then to lead us to conversion. And this is imperative. Being poor in spirit is imperative to true self-reflection, right? You have to be humble so you can see the truth, so that you can turn from it, and then you can allow the Lord to bless you upon all of the other blessing that he's already giving to you because he's converting you, he's transforming you to the glory of heaven. And so it's important for us to ask ourselves, are we humbled in the presence of the Lord? Do we just show up and say, Lord, just show me your truth? Or do we go in there with like a list of excuses or reasons or explanations, or we have to tell him the story of why we're this way or why this thing happened? Or do we just show up and say, yes, this is my current state. Show me how I'm supposed to be. Show me what you want me to be and what you, with all of your grace, are going to transform within me. It's a big question. I think a lot of us have a problem with that. I know I do. I have, to, I have to check myself a lot and, you know, stop explaining things to God because he already knows. He was, he's been there through everything. You know what I mean? And then we also need to ask if we seek to be empty vessels to be filled with God's will. And this one was very difficult for me to accept. And sometimes I think I forget it. Or maybe it's just like selective. I have a selective um, memory on certain things. And this is one of them. Sometimes we desire things for ourselves that are good and that are holy, but they are not God's will for us, which is kind of hard for us to grasp sometimes to think like, why wouldn't the Lord want this for me? It's a good thing. It's a holy thing. But you know what? He wants something very unique for you, something that you might not be able to see at this moment in your life, 
but maybe in a week, a month, a year, a couple of years from now, you're going to see, oh, wow. Yeah, I followed the Lord's will and I am, I have been blessed beyond blessed because of it. You know, and you can look back and say, yeah, if I would have demanded that the Lord give me my will, I would have ended up in a very different place. And I'm glad that I followed the Lord's will because the Lord's will is perfect for me. So yeah, we need to meditate on this and ask, do I really seek to be an empty vessel? Lord, give me the grace to seek to be an empty vessel so that I can fulfill your will for me. Because we know deep down, we know that his will is perfect for us versus the things in this life that we're holding on to that he's like, just got to loosen your grip because I have something else, something better suited for you. And then the second beatitude is blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. When it comes to the beatitudes, St. Gregory of Nyssa, he saw them as building one upon the other. So Mourning comes after we've allowed ourselves to be poor in spirit, right? So after we've become poor in spirit and we've humbled ourselves to let Christ transform us, we begin to ascend in holiness, right? So the Lord is elevating us and we're becoming holier. And when we're being elevated, we now have a new vantage point. And from our new vantage point, our perspective is different, right? Because we're able to see the perfection of God a little bit more clearly because we're a little bit more holy, which is a good thing. But the downside to this, this is the reason why we mourn, is because when we're able to see God and his perfection more clearly and more fully, we are now able to see such a stark difference between fallen humanity and God's perfection. And so the reason that we mourn is considered a blessing because it creates in us a desire to be transformed by Christ, right? Because we can see now more clearly since we started to grow in holiness, we can see the perfection of God a little bit more clearly. And then we can see the difference more clearly between the fallen nature of humanity and God's perfection. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. But the reason we feel that like that mourning sense is because we do not want that stark difference to exist. We want to be as close to the perfection of God as possible, right? And so that's the desire that comes that is considered blessed because once we have that desire to be more like Christ, we can surrender ourselves more fully and be like, look, just restore me to your image. So we have to ask ourselves, is this us? Are we ready? Are we honestly ready to see our reflections in Christ? Are we ready to trust that when we see our reflections in Christ, what he shows us is only being shown to us because he wants to restore what is fallen and broken within us to glory, to something that we could never achieve on our own, right? We have to ask, are we ready for that? Do we trust that? And if we don't, and if we're not ready, why not? And I hate to do this. As you can see, we've kind of run out of time a little bit today. So there we go, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope that it's enriched your thinking about what's currently going on in Oral's mind and soul at this point in the book. And once again, I'll encourage you all to go and check out Rochelle's podcast, Clumsy Theosis. It is very good. (laughs) And please come back and join us again next Tuesday when Matt and I will be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers.